Ezekiel has not always been the easiest book of the Bible to study. Up until today's lesson, most of it has been dark, depressing, gloomy, full of judgment and wrath. But regardless of the past, I have some news about the future. The best is yet to come. Because the book is making a major turning point in this section that we're in. So far, we've just encountered the bad news. But now we're in a part that's called the gospel according to Ezekiel. That's what some commentaries call it. And the word gospel means good news. So we have some good news for you today. And this good news will be in the form of future prophecy. This book is turning its attention toward the future for the material that we're going to talk about in today's verses. And so we're covering the back half of Ezekiel 34 on this episode. We're going to answer these questions. Why does God bring trials into our lives that cripple and hobble us? Who is the David spoken of in verse 23? And is it possible that we're in the millennium right now? You'll find out today on the Cross References Podcast. Welcome to the Book of Ezekiel, a cross-references Bible study where we learn how every small piece of the Bible tells one big story and how they all connect to the cross and Christ. My name is Luke Taylor, and I'm a sheep, and I follow the Good Shepherd. And if you've read your New Testament, you know who that is, Jesus. Where we left off last week, we were reading these verses from John 10, verses 14 and 15. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, most commentators believe that Jesus was not just making a metaphor about himself, but that he was actually drawing back to Ezekiel 34 specifically. And so Ezekiel 34, if you didn't hear it last time, this is a passage about good and bad pastors, which I related in the previous section to good and bad, um, or I'm sorry, this section's about shepherds, but I related it to good and bad pastors. And so um, there were lessons in there that could be for leaders of all types, but I most specifically see it as speaking to pastors because the New Testament metaphor for a pastor or the word for it is the same word for shepherd. So we talked about that last time. Uh, you know, as we discussed, our leaders can fail us and they can disappoint us. They can be bad leaders who um, they take advantage of their followers. They take advantage of their sheep. And Jesus proclaimed himself to be a better shepherd, the best shepherd, the good shepherd. And he is the one who will properly take care of his flock and hold those bad shepherds accountable. So this next sec section of Ezekiel 34, we're going to read a panel of verses that are about how the good shepherd takes care of his flock. And then what we're going to do is cross-reference that with John 10 once again. So we'll start at verse 11 here of Ezekiel 34. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. So as we talked about last time, the bad shepherds would scatter the sheep. And God doesn't want his sheep to be scattered. God wants his flock united. I think of that long prayer that Jesus prayed right before he went to the cross, and I think it's John chapter 17, and he prayed there that we, the church, that we would be one, one with the Father and one with each other. This is God's desire. He wants unity. And God desires that those who've been cast off and separated and those who are missing from the flock, that they would be brought in. See, God, from his vantage point of eternity and how, seeing everything, seeing the whole world, he looks out at it. He sees all the people out there who are willing to accept the gospel of salvation and who need to be brought into the sheepfold. And so he says, my sheep have been scattered. But he says, I will bring them out from the peoples and I will gather them from the countries. And so God wants all his sheep brought together, no matter where they are. If they're Jewish, if they're Gentile, whatever, he wants to build his church. So this is why Jesus said in John 10, 16, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. 
So it's the same message that Ezekiel is writing right here in chapter 34. The sheep that are not of this fold, that's talking about the Gentiles, okay? God's plan of salvation all through the Bible was not just to save Jew and Jew, but to save Gentile as well. You know, we can forget how good we have it sometimes. You know, if you're a Gentile like me, we, we forget that, um, that <laughs> we have it pretty good that we've been brought into something that wasn't originally for us. I mean, you know, we, we can feel like the Bible but was just written to everybody, okay? And it was, but it kind of wasn't. You know, that would be a pretty good trick question. Was the Bible written for everybody? Well, yes, but also no. <laughs> it was written to the Jews, okay? It was written to the Israelites. It was a Jewish book for a Jewish people, but it was also written for everybody because God's desire was that all, even non-Jews, that we would pick this book up and that we would read it and get saved. And so to come into this faith is a great privilege to us who are Gentiles. It's a great privilege. This faith was first delivered to the Jews. And so that's why Jesus would tell them, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So if you're not Jewish, he was talking about you and me. So that's really exciting. What does he say to us? Well, Ezekiel 34, 14, I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the, bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. So there's another good cross-reference for this. Uh, maybe you thought of it as, as I was reading these verses, but Psalm 23, the one that begins, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That's what he says right here too. Um, why does he make us lie down? Well, sheep are so skittish that the shepherd has to make them lie down sometimes. It's hard for sheep to relax. It's hard for them to sit still. Uh, you know, remember a couple weeks ago, we had a lesson about be still and know that I am God, that we need to take time to slow down and rest and reflect on the Lord to talk to him. And if we're not going to do that voluntarily, then he has to make us lie down. You know, he, and, and that can be all kinds of different ways. So you might send a setback into our lives, a waiting season into our lives and make us to lie down. He is the good shepherd, and he has his reasons for doing those things. He, he has his reasons for allowing trials into our lives. And he said here, he will bring back the strayed, the, the, the sheep who have strayed, the prodigal sons who don't deserve it, those who came to God and then they blew it, and maybe they feel too ashamed of themselves to come back. God says he will get them, and he's going to take them back. Um, if you're a Christian who's strayed, well, let me say this, I've noticed Maybe I'll use this as a warning. I've noticed for many Christians, whenever they want to run off into sin, sometimes God will just knock you right on your butt, <laughs> you know, just to get your attention, just to say, hey, you might see other people of the world running off into this stuff, but you do not follow them. And he does that for our good. He doesn't want to see his sheep stray. And, but if you do stray, he's always willing to take you back. So he's a good shepherd. He brings, he brings back the strays. He says he will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Sometimes we get injured in this life. We get injured by this world. We get injured by the enemy. We get injured by ourselves. You know, sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's others' fault. But just because you get injured by this life, by this world, it doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. Even whenever you blew it, when you injured yourself, God says he will bind you up and strengthen you. So God still has a plan for you. I've heard it said that the shepherds of old, that they would sometimes intentionally break their sheep's legs. Now, that sounds crazy. You say, why would, why would a shepherd intentionally break his own sheep's leg? Well, a shepherd might do that if this sheep had just a bad habit of wandering off, if the sheep wouldn't trust or stay close to the shepherd. And so after the sheep had messed up enough times, the shepherd would take that sheep and he'd hold out his leg and he'd take out his rod and he'd break the sheep's leg. Now, why would he do that? Is that just punishment? It's more of discipline. You see, the sheep could not walk on this leg while it was broken. So after the shepherd broke that sheep's leg, he'd pick up the sheep, and he would carry him on his back. And he would do that until the leg was healed. 
So during this time, as the sheep was being carried by the shepherd, the sheep was learning dependence on the shepherd. He was learning that he could trust him. He learned to walk with the shepherd so that whenever it came time to walk on his own, the shepherd, or I'm sorry, the sheep, the sheep knew how to stay near to the shepherd and not let himself get out of the shepherd's presence. And the same can be true in our lives. Sometimes God has to do something to break our legs. He has to hobble us for a bit. And it can hurt. And we wonder, why would a good God allow such pain into my life? But through that process, we learn to trust him. We learn to depend on him. We learn how to remain in his presence, even after we've healed from whatever broke us. We, we've learned how to stay in the presence of the shepherd. And so we come out of that trial stronger than how we went into it. Now, when I was, I'm t- just going to be honest, when I was 18 or 20 years old, I wouldn't have liked a message like this very much. You know, when back then, if I had a trial in my life, I would have just been more likely to just get mad at God about it. You know, I'd say, well, God, I know you're real. I don't doubt that you're real. I know you're in control. So I know you, you know, you didn't have to let this happen to me. Why are you even allowing me to have to deal with this hard thing? You know, why is, why is, it just doesn't seem fair. I didn't do anything wrong. Life's so unfair. That's probably what I would have said back then. Now that I'm a bit older and I've been through a few hard seasons in my life, I'm understanding more and more how God's furnace is his refining fire. I understand how I've come through some of these things better than how I went into them. I didn't ask for the trials. I didn't want the trials. But today I'm even, I'm thankful for some of the trials I've went through. I'm thankful for how they brought me closer to the Lord. How they brought my faith to a deeper place that I know I wouldn't have got there without them. Now, I'm not just saying this to sound spiritually mature or holy or something. I'm just, I'm trying to be real with you. I'm going to, I'm not going to pretend I'm always thankful for every trial I've gone through. Okay. (laughs) Maybe I should be, but I'm not spiritually mature enough for that yet. There's some things that, you know, there's hard times I've gone through that I'm just like, I still don't understand what was behind all that. And, and some of the hard times I've gone through, they might've just been my own fault. You know, maybe I did something boneheaded. But I'll say this, even in those situations where I did something to cause my own, str- my own strife or whatever, God would even use those situations to teach me something and bring me closer to him. And, and it's good to be closer to him because he's the good shepherd. All right, well, let's go on to the next set of verses. Um, verses 17 through 19. This is going to be talking about how the father judges. And so Ezekiel 34, 17, as for you, my flock, thus says the Lord, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Verse 18, is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread water with your feet, the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? And so what it's, uh, what it's saying to us right there. It's talking about how God is going to judge within his own flock. Um, To put this in modern terms, it speaks of how Jesus is managing his church. When one church member is bullying or taking advantage of another member of the church, Jesus has ways of dealing with that. Now, I'm not saying I always know how God is going to deal with it, but I'll say this, he does have his ways. Uh, Whenever someone's living in sin, whenever someone's doing something wrong, God has his way of exposing them and, and dealing with it. So in these verses, it says when one sheep is fat and another sheep is skinny, or whenever one of them has muddied uh, the water of another, um, it's using, you know, metaphors here, but it's saying God notices these things and God will judge between sheep and sheep. Uh, I just just spent a week at the county fair um, for my work, and I saw a lot of people judging between sheep and sheep (laughs) while I was out there. Well, you know, there's and in these competitions, there's... um, there's, there's judges who come and they inspect the animals and all that. And uh, I just was, so as I was thinking about this lesson and, and thinking about what I've been studying in Ezekiel 34, I would just reflect on that as I was out at the fair and watching these sheep inspectors go around and they they look at just every little detail, things that I, as a, as I grew up on a farm, but I'm really not a farmer, it's things I would never notice about animals. But these judges, they'd go out there and they would just point out the most minute little things about a little flaw with this animal, 
or something that made an, an animal exceptional. You know, they would notice all these things. And the, uh, the rest of us would just be like, you know, I didn't even see that. And so uh, we have a judge who will judge between sheep and sheep. A master sheep inspector. Our shepherd who watches over us. He sees everything. He sees all the details. And if you've been treated unfairly, God saw it. And if you treated someone else unfairly, he saw it. And God's going to deal with all of this unfairness in our lives. He's going to deal with the mistreatment that we receive from other people. And, um, and so that's what he's saying right here. But then he makes this transition as he's saying this. He's going to make a transition right here to start talking about future events. Okay? Which, when Ezekiel was written, all of this was future. But now it's going to go to where it's even future for us. Verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with, the, with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. <laughs> it made me think of the Mandalorian right there. I have spoken. <laughs> so here is the transition to the future that a lot of people, um, or I'm sorry, that a lot of verses, a lot of chapters in the Bible that, that talk about future prophecy, they make this transition a lot. When you're reading prophetic literature, as you're reading along through the prophets, it's, it's all going along fine. It's making sense. And then out of the blue, it just jumps ahead thousands of years. And it's just talking about stuff in the future, stuff that may not have even happened yet. And so that's what it seems to do right here whenever we hit verses 22 and 23. All of a sudden, it seems to start talking about the millennium. Now, if you're a longtime listener of this podcast, you may know that I take the premillennial view of Scripture. Like, I believe that the end times are still in front of us when we talk about the end times, that this has not happened yet, that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation, and then at the end of that, Jesus will return, and then he's going to set up a 1,000-year reign. And so I think that the millennium is a millennium. <laughs> it's not all millennial, okay? A, <laughs> I believe it is a millennium, though. It's a 1,000 years, okay? We're going to be studying the millennium a lot as we go forward on the podcast. And so whenever I read something like verse 22... I don't know how to read this except as something that's going to be taking place in the millennium. Okay, here was verse 22. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. I'm really looking forward to that day when I'm no longer a prey. But that day has not come yet, because as long as evil is allowed to reign and, and allowed to flourish in this world, there's possibility that we, even we Christians, could be prey. And that's going to continue until Jesus comes back and until Jesus becomes king of the world. So I believe now it's talking about that future time. And then verse 23 said something kind of curious. He said, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. Now what's this talking about? Well, there's two schools of thought about this. And so some take this as a messianic prophecy, that it's speaking there of Jesus, referring to him as David right there. Uh, a possible reason for that be, could be because the Messiah was always said to be a descendant of David. And there was this huge promise made to King David in 2 Samuel 7 that was regarding this, that the Messiah is going to sit on the throne of David. So some believe that this right here in Ezekiel 34, when it says David, that it's talking about Jesus when it says that. Um, then there's others who believe it's actually talking about King David, that he himself has a role to play in Christ's millennial kingdom. And there's going to actually be some evidence for that view as we go forward in Ezekiel, as we get to the last chapters of Ezekiel. And that's going to be still some months away. So consider this just maybe a teaser for that. We're going to dig into that a lot more. But there is some legitimacy to this view that the King David that it talks about in verse 23 and later in Ezekiel, that he is really King David, that he's going to have a role to play in the millennium. And so we'll get into all that later. For today, let's just, I'm just going to read the last seven verses of today's chapter and make some comments about that, and then we'll wrap it up. These are blessings of the millennial kingdom period. 
verse starting at verse 25. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them in the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And the earth shall yield its increase. And they shall be secure in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslave them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture. And I am your God, declares the Lord God. So I know that, you know, it sounded like a lot of, um, it might have sounded kind of repetitive right there. It was actually just three promises, and it did repeat them a few times. So it sounds like more than three things that he said. He was really just saying three things, and and they all relate to security. And so this is security for those who dwell in God's kingdom. It said you're going to have security with the animals or the wild beasts. Now, some see this as referring to literal animals, and there's some truth to that. Um, It seems that in the millennial kingdom of Christ, that the meat-eating animals that they're going to Leave the other animals alone, and I, I assume the people too, because it says, uh, Isaiah eleven six. 6, it's a famous verse. Uh, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the shepherd shall lie down with the young goat. And so that implies that the meat-eating animals were, are not going to eat meat anymore when we get into the millennium. Uh, there's another way of understanding the wild beast comment. It could be talking there about demons or dark spiritual beings, the ones who try to harm humans. We're, we're going to be given security from them as well when we get to the millennium. And then uh, it said security and food supply. That's the second promise right there. Th- that the land will be well watered and th- that it will bear fruit for us. So all of our material needs are going to be met. And then lastly, the last promise was security from oppressors. Those who would try to bully or to take advantage of us. People who would attack us or even just look. It said even look down, with, look down on us to, to suffer the reproach of the nations. To be ashamed of yourself because of how others see you. We're not even going to have to deal with that in the millennial kingdom. In Jesus' kingdom, we won't have to worry about how others look at us, okay? Now, some will take these promises that the Bible talks about for the future, and they say that this applies to the church, or that this applies to us right now, today. Um, Those who are amillennial, they, they say that there is no millennium. They say, or that basically that it's not about a thousand year reign of Christ that's coming someday, but that all this stuff the Bible speaks of as future, it just applies to us now spiritually. So they'd say that these verses will apply to you right now, that the moment you got saved, that these verses started to apply to you. But you know what? Our experience tells us otherwise. And I say the New Testament tells us otherwise. We still have to deal with demons. We still have oppressors in our lives. Now, maybe you could make a point about this with the second promise, the the one about food security. You know, Jesus did say God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive and and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you? You know, in other words, Jesus said our material needs are going to be met if we seek God's kingdom and, and his righteousness first. So you could say that that one applies to today. You might be able to make a case for that one. But those other promises, they're not going to be a, re- a reality until the kingdom of God is built by Jesus in his thousand-year reign. So I've got some bad news. We aren't in the millennium yet. Many of these promises that we find out about it, they do not apply to 2024. But I've also got some good news. It's still going to happen. That kingdom is going to be here someday. And the best is yet to come. Next time on this podcast, we're going to move right along into chapter 35, and that chapter is so short, I anticipate that I'm just going to complete it all in one episode. And so we'll cover all of Ezekiel 35 next time, but let me tell you this, I'm going to take next week off, okay, if you can oblige me for a, <laughs> to take a week off. The reason is that I'm just, I'm really running behind right now. 
I went on vacation like a month ago. And ever since then, it's just like it's been hard to catch up on things. And so and I just had to spend a week at the county fair for my work, like I said before. And so I've just been I've been kind of running behind on things. I need to get some home repairs done. I got some stuff going on. So I would just like to take a week off from this podcast just to catch up on life. I'll be back in two weeks. And so then we will, that'll be July 29th. And that'll be whenever we cover Ezekiel 35. So please make sure that you're subscribed so that you can get that episode. Um, Closing thoughts today. I just wanted to share this breakdown of everything that's coming in Ezekiel. This is from the New International Commentary on the Old Testament on Ezekiel. And it's by Daniel Block. And in that book, in that commentary, this is one of them I've been using as I go through the book of Ezekiel. It's like if you it's actually a part one and a part two to cover all of Ezekiel. So it's like sixteen hundred pages altogether. And we got through. Let me see. We've gotten through eleven hundred of them so far on this podcast, like as far as material that we've covered on in Ezekiel. I've gotten through 1,100 pages of that commentary, so only 500 to go. (laughs) But anyway, he gives a breakdown in that book of um, where these last chapters of Ezekiel, what they are, what they are doing. And so chapter 34, which we just finished, that's about restoring Yahweh's role. Chapter 35 will be about restoring Yahweh's land. Chapter 36 is restoring Yahweh's honor. Chapter 37 is restoring Yahweh's people. Chapters 38 and 39 are restoring Yahweh's supremacy. And then chapters 40 through 48 is about restoring Yahweh's presence. And um, I just love that breakdown. That is what is to come here on this podcast as we go through the last chapters. Still, you know, got almost a third of the book left. But as we go through these last chapters of Ezekiel, that is what is to come. So we're just in this really positive portion of scripture right now. It kind of reminds me of Romans 8. That's like the most positive chapter in the Bible. Romans 8, it has all those iconic verses. You've heard them a million times. You know, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's how it starts off. It ends with that epic verse about how nothing can separate us from the love of God whenever we are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's just an amazing chapter. And right in the midst of it all is this amazing verse. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Here's a breakdown that I heard of that verse one time. Three things that we learn from that verse. Your bad things work out for your good. Your good things cannot be lost. And the best is yet to come. Guys, studying Ezekiel has not always been easy. It's been dark depressing, even gloomy at times. And life in this world, it's not always easy. Maybe some of you listening, you've had lives that were dark or depressing or gloomy at times. And if that's your experience, I'm not going to argue with it. You have your experience. But I want to say this, regardless of your past, we have some good news about the future. The best is yet to come. Thanks for listening to this Cross References Bible Study on the book of Ezekiel. This has been Luke Taylor, and I hope the Bible makes more sense to you after this episode.